Yeah, this is a good watermelon. <laughs> I may have just cracked the code on how to pick the best watermelon from the grocery store. And I invented this cup as part of the process. But getting to this point was not easy. It involved over 500 pounds of watermelon, lots of testing and science, and an epic watermelon tasting party with a bunch of our friends. Now, picking a watermelon can be difficult because if you walk up to a bin of watermelons, chances are most of them are average and some of them are either really bad or super delicious. So my goal is to do an experiment to figure out which picking techniques lead to the delicious ones, or at least which ones you can use to avoid picking the bad ones. I'll reveal all the results and our findings on best picking technique. But first, what are the most common picking techniques? Well, according to Google, the most common techniques break down into three categories, appearance, shape, and sound. Before you even pick up a melon, most people claim that you should look for an orange field spot, not white, a brown stem, not green, and darker stripes without having a shiny surface. Related to shape, circular or regular shapes instead of oval or irregular are thought to be sweeter. It's thought that the heavier melons for their size are the best. What about sound? Can you really tell which melon is better based on the sound that it makes when you knock on it? We saw several people doing this at the store, so maybe there's something to it. For the experiment, we're gonna buy as many melons that we can fit in a cart from a single bin at the grocery store. All right, we're gonna go get some watermelon. Once we have the melons, we'll record picking technique data for each one, and then do a blind taste test to correlate the picking data to the best and worst tasting melons from the bin. Sorry. All right, I'll push it tomorrow. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. We we really like watermelons. <laughs> yep. Dude, I have never bought this many watermelons in my life. Give me nine, seven, twenty-five. Okay. It's like coming loose because we have so many watermelons in there. <laughs> Once we got them home, we put each melon through rigorous testing at each of our homemade picking technique stations. Station one was our photo booth, where we took pictures and videos of each melon to document their overall appearance, taking notes on field spots, stems, stripe colors, and surface shininess. After that, we weighed and measured them at our baby scale station. Because we took measurements on both the long and short diameters, we could compute the volume with this equation. By taking the weight and dividing it by the calculated volume, you can see which melons were the heaviest for their size. We also tried to measure volume and density by dunking the melons in our homemade dunk tank station, but our setup wasn't accurate and we ended up scrapping it. For sound, we placed all the melons in the ground and took audio recordings of their sound when you knock on them so that we could later analyze them to see if sound plays a role in picking a good or bad melon. The final station was my favorite, the Fruit Ninja Station, where we cut open all the melons to start putting them into taste testing cups. We also measured the sugar content of each melon using a refractometer. This way, we can get a clear picture of which melons were actually the sweetest compared to the tasting results. We finished all of our testing and watermelon slicing just as our friends started arriving for the watermelon party. So now all that was left to do was to break out the slip and slide and treat our friends to both delicious and potentially gross watermelon. Best day ever! We used this rubric to determine overall taste and rating on texture, juiciness, and sweetness. We also had everyone take notes on the melons they thought were either exceptionally good or exceptionally bad, including adding stars for their favorite tasting melons. This way, there would be no doubt which ones were actually the best and worst in the bin. We love watermelon. The results were fairly consistent, and in general, texture was more significant than sweetness in the overall ranking of the melons. But before we get into it, allow me to officially introduce you to the watermelons. About half of the 25 watermelon had orange field spots. Eight of them had white and the rest didn't have any. Five of the melons with orange field spots also had brown stems and four of those had regular shapes. So according to Google and based on appearance alone, either melon 10, 12, 16, or two 
should be the best. And we have high hopes for Watermelon 2 because it was also the heaviest for its size out of all 25. But Watermelon 2 ended up in the bottom three and melons 10, 12, and 16 were just average. The best melons were four, five, and 17. Melon 4 had light striping, Melon 5 had darker striping, and 17 was the only of those three with an orange field spot. So from these results, it's clear that you can't just rely on appearance, shape, or heaviness per size. But what if you also consider the sound when you knock on it? To see if there's any correlation, I'm gonna play the actual recorded sounds from the top three best melons, and then the actual recorded sounds from the bottom three worst melons. Comparing the tasting results, Melon 4 took third place in both texture and sweetness rating. Melon 5 took second place in texture rating and fourth place in sweetness rating. And Melon 17 took first place in both texture and sweetness. For the worst melons, melons 2 and 20 were both in the bottom three in texture rating with multiple comments saying that they were mushy and grainy, but their sweetness ratings were average. And melon 23 was rated just the opposite, having an average texture, but multiple comments said it didn't taste like anything. It tasted more like water than watermelon. Now, if I was just picking one melon instead of 25, I probably wouldn't have picked melons 20 or 23. Melon 20 noticeably had a lot of scarring on the surface, which could have been a sign for how overripe it was inside. And Melon 23 was an irregular shape and really faded looking, which could have been a sign for how bland it was. For this group, there was a slight trend with the better melons being smaller in size. But there were plenty of melons where these signs just weren't as obvious. So let's compare the sounds again. This time, I'll play it back with the frequency waveforms also shown. Can you hear any difference? Go back and rewind if you want to hear it again because I'm about to tell you. According to the data, the melons that most often had the best texture were the ones with resonant sounds, which means that the melons with the best texture sounded more like you were tapping on a drum than if you were tapping on leather. In other words, the best melons had more frequency peaks on their frequency graph sound waveforms. And these are the melons that had the most frequency peaks. So you can see how they correlate to the most liked melons. This correlation isn't perfect. Watermelon 7 and 23 sounded like a drum, but were below average to gross. There was also a slight correlation with melons having a lower pitch, registering as sweeter both in the taste testing and measured sugar content. Although it's not perfect, here is my recommendation based on 500 pounds worth of watermelon data for how to pick the best watermelon from the grocery store. To start, narrow down the melons by the smaller ones that have a more consistent shape. Eliminate the ones that feel soft or have sunken in browning in some of the scratches or blemishes. From there, our data shows that the best you can do is to knock on the rest and pick the one that sounds like a lower pitched bass drum. And because I'm not very good at telling the small differences in pitch or resonance, I invented something that I could use to knock on the melons and show me the sound waveforms in real time. Meet the world's first and probably only attempt at a working watermelon knocker. To make the knocker, I took a wooden dowel and put a rubber stopper on the end of it. It has a spring on the inside so that when I pull up, it gives a consistent knock every single time. Also hidden on the inside are a pair of inexpensive Bluetooth earbuds that are connected to my phone. And my phone has a free sound frequency analyzer app that's used to display the sounds. To make it look slightly less ridiculous, I disguised it as an everyday carry item by taking the wooden dowel, making it look like a straw, and putting it in a reusable Starbucks cup. Then all I have to do as a first picking technique is take the secret cup out of the cup holder, knock on a bunch of melons, and then just pick the one that has the most spikes on the graph that are lowest in pitch. 
And just to be clear, this is completely unnecessary and somewhat over-engineered. It doesn't really matter what you use to knock on the watermelon. It's kind of like a xylophone where the watermelon or the metal bar is still gonna make the same pitch and resonance regardless of what you use to knock on it. But I thought that this made the video slightly more interesting, so I did it anyways for you.